Flying Lessons by Soman Chenani. Nani wears a fur coat to the beach. It's my second clue she doesn't plan to go swimming. The first came earlier this morning when she rang up the Chanel boutique in Pasig de Garcia and asked them to find a selection of swim trunks for a young boy of 12 with practically no hips and a small bottom to room 213 at the Palacio Barcelona. Half asleep, I slid up in bed, swaddled in a voluminous white robe monogrammed with the hotel's initials, and peered up at my grandmother. Posed imperiously at the window, she was already done up in a matador red chiffon dress, her dyed caramel hair teased into a beehive, her brown eyes drenched in blue mascara, and her lips coated the color of blood. I could hear the Chanel clerk through the head handset trying to get a word in, but Nani was prattling away. Something stylish and sophisticated, of course, whatever Los Chicos are wearing in an Ibiza, she breezed, unaware of how ludicrous Spanglish sounded in an Indian accent. Though nothing in black, only Italians wear black to swim. Aren't you getting a bathing suit too, I started, but Nani waved me off, gyp gypsy bangles jangling on her wrist. On the bed table, there was a gilded tray of two cafes con leche, ham and cheese croissants, and tostadas slathered, slathered in tomatoes and olive oil. Nani's coffee cup was already drained. And please be rapido about it, she was saying. It's my grandson's first trip out of Florida, and I can't have him spending the entire day in the hotel. Through the phone, I heard the clerk huffing that Chanel doesn't carry men's clothes, let alone swim trunks, let alone deliver them to tourists at home hotels, but Nani simply smiled like a cat. Tell Armando that Kamla Sani says hello, she replied and hung up the phone. Three hours later, I'm chasing Nani across the sun-drenched shores of La Marbella, wearing a striped Chanel red and white swimsuit so tiny and tight, I keep peeking down to make sure it's still there, while Nani sweeps across the golden sand in her couture dress, red stiletto heels, and white fur coat that make her look like the Indian version of Cruella de Vil. You promised to take me to the beach, I yell. And I am. You didn't say anything about staying with you, Nani calls, shielded by enormous Paloma Picasso sunglasses. But I don't know anyone here, and my Spanish is terrible. You can't leave me in the middle of nowhere all alone. It's a beach. It's not an alleyway in Las Ramblas. I'm just getting a wash and blow at Rossini Fer Ferretti and meeting an old acquaintance at Cafe, Cafe Gijon. I won't be more than a few hours. A few hours? What do you expect me to do with a few hours? What any boy your age should do on a beach in Spain. Make friends, she impels as we approach a crowded inlet. Here we are. Yamiya at the hotel told me this is where the most exclusive people go. I can feel the bodies around me, but I can't bear to look at them. Please, don't leave me alone. I'll come with you. But she's already sashaying away. Making friends is easy. I do it all the time. Heart hammering, I glance up at the packed beach, finally seeing the people around me. My stomach implodes. Grandma, I cry. She turns on her heel, alarmed. They're naked, I scream. You brought me to a naked beach. Nani gapes at me, then raises her eyes and pulls down her sunglasses. As she takes in the sea of bodies, her almond skin blanches, tight wrinkles creasing her forehead. She's a hawk caught in a trap. But then her eyes float down to me, quivering in my speedo like a spooked starlet, and she pulls up her sunglasses with a stern smile. Oh, my little darling, you have such an imagination, she coos and glides away without looking back. Nani never asked if I wanted to go on this trip. She just flounced into our kitchen at 8 a.m. on a scorching June morning, wearing a Dior sweatsuit, drinking a power greens juice, and extolling the virtues of Pilates before informing my mother she was taking me on a three-week trip across Europe and that I'd need a passport, haircut, and a new wardrobe that wasn't from Old Navy. She never addressed my two two brothers who were eating breakfast with me, nor explained to me why I was the one chosen for this foreign tour, nor allowed my mother a say in the matter. She just drained her juice, gave our plates of soggy French toast a pitying glare, and jaunted out of the house. Less than a month later, I am alone on a naked beach. I am alone on a naked beach. There we go. When we started this trip, I thought it would be a packed itinerary of cultural landmarks, Guided ferries down the Thames, tours of the Prado and awful Eiffel Tower, afternoon tea at Dutch brasseries while I got ahead on my summer reading for school. Instead, 
I haven't seen a single museum or palace or anything else we learned about in Ms. Fisher's class. And I'm pretty sure that Nani secretly threw out my summer reading books during a custom shirt search in Copenhagen. In Berlin, she left me stranded in the middle of a dodgy parade. In Marseille, she paid a fast-talking young cab driver named Gail to take me out with his wild teenage friends while he, she shopped for shoes. And yesterday, on our first night in Spain, I dressed up in a suit and combed my hair so I'd look nice for the theater, only to end up cowering in the front row in an adults-only burlesque. Why can't I have a normal grandmother? Why is every second of this trip a walk off the gangplank? Nani returns to the beach four hours later in a completely new dress and hairstyle and finds me hiding in a dank, foul-smelling cave, knees bald to my chest. Have you really been in here the whole time? She frowns. This is pointless, I mumble. All of this is pointless. It's true, Nani sighs, eyeing my new swimsuit. If I knew you'd spend the whole day in the dark, you could have just worn your underpants instead. I give her the silent treatment all the way back to the hotel. Did you take mom away too when she was young, I ask later, struggling to crack a stone crab at dinner. Your mother is like your grandfather, Nani says vaguely, already finished shelling and eating hers. What's that mean, I ask, trying to keep the slippery crab in the silver cracker. They'd rather stay home and do work. Yeah, but that's how they both make money. And what do they do with it, Nanny? Nani fires? Your mother hoards every dime as if she'll live forever. Your grandfather hasn't taken me to a movie or dinner or show or anywhere else in 15 years. We're old now, he says. We're old. But he lets you spend as much money as you want. Money, she pounces. What good is money to a bird in a cage? Her eyes glow with emotion. For the first time, I can't find Nani inside of them. Slowly, her gaze softens, her hands unclench. Santosh, sweetie, you really sat there in that dark cave the whole afternoon. What was I supposed to do? Enjoy the scenery? By the time I came back, the beach was teeming with families, says Nani, taking a big swig of champagne. You were so busy worrying about naked aunties that you didn't notice all the kids your age running around looking as friendly as could be. I give up on the crab. Can we just visit the Basilica Sangrada like other Americans? She puts down her glass. Do you know why I brought you on this trip, Santosh? So you could get away from Grandpa? She lets out a cackle. No, well, yes, but no, I brought you on this trip because you win too many awards at school. I stare at her blankly. What? Best in math, best in English, best in debate, history, science course. How many awards can you win? Every year I come to the ceremony and watch you go back and forth to the stage, picking up all the trophies and making me and your mother carry them because there are too many for you to hold. Nani, I say, losing my patience, what does winning awards have to do with anything? Because when you're older, no one cares how many awards you win, Santosh. People care if you have something to talk about. And right now, all you have to talk about are things from books. My cheeks are hot. I'm pretty sure that my Nani, my 69-year-old Nani, is calling me a nerd. Not just a nerd, but a nerd who doesn't have a life, who has no friends, who is a complete and total loser. The cool boys at school taunt me the same way with their perfect faces and athletic bodies and 2020 eyes. But it doesn't matter what they say because every year at the last assembly, they and their parents have to sit there and watch me win every single last award while they win nothing, nada, zilch. And they'll continue to watch me win every last award until senior year when I'm valedictorian and I go to Harvard and I have a real life while they look back and realize that I was the cool kid all along and they were the losers. So for Nani, the one person who I look up to more than anyone in this world, the one person who is supposed to love me unconditionally, to now say the same thing as the hot boys at school, she sees it in my face. I used to love seeing you win all those awards, Santosh. I loved seeing you and your mother happy, she says softly. But now when you win, you don't smile anymore. The more you win, the less happy you look. Heat rips through me and I turn away. I'll be happy when I get home from this trip. A long pause stretches between us. I can feel my jaw clamp shut. Nani's hand gently touches mine. Santosh, all I'm asking is that for the last two days of our trip, I want you to forget about books and trophies and school. 
You don't know me, okay? I retort, but my voice fades as I say it, and for once, Nani lets me piddle with my crab in silence. The next day, I ask to go back to the beach. Nani seems to have anticipated this because my swim trunks have been steam cleaned and she's already made her own plans for the day, which include a manicure at the Pink Peony and lunch with old friends at La Teteraria. Before we depart, she stuffs my backpack with a bag of dried mango, two bottles of Pellegrino, and her La Roche-Posay sunscreen. Though when I try to slip in a book I bought at the shop yesterday, she sighs so defeatedly that I give up and leave it behind. This time, she asks Yamiya to direct us to a beach more child-appropriate, and we end up at Nova Icaria, an S-shaped curve of hot gold sand sloping down to coral green water. Nani buys me a vanilla ice cream cone. Vanilla, she jabs, when you they have olive saffron or mascarpone, and watches as I slink out to the sand before she gives, gives me a last reassuring smile and hustles away. I forgot to bring a towel, so I wince as I sit down in, sm in the smoldering sand, a fair distance from the sea and the kids swimming in it. There doesn't seem to be anyone here over the age of 16. A few lanky, deep tan boys are on each other's shoulders playing chicken, while another group of them try to do handstands in the shallow water. Girls hang out in giggly packs, inspecting the boys. Those that aren't with their friends are in couples, splashing, wrestling, whispering, and kissing. Nobody is alone, except me. It should be easy to make friends. Nani does it. My brothers do it. Everyone does it. It's as if it's, if it's as normal as eating, sleeping, breathing. I remind myself that it's natural to be on my own in a foreign country, but even if I were on the beach two miles from my house, I'd be sitting solo in the exact same spot with my melting vanilla. It's like there's a, a chromosome for fun I didn't get. The ball and chain, my younger brother's friend once murmured as I left the room. It's almost as if, without knowing it, I made some deal with the devil. I can have all the success in the world, but no one will ever like me. I don't want that deal anymore. I want to unmake it. <sighs> Dear God, please help me, and I promise all a ball hits me in the chest. It's red and small and pegs me so hard and fast that the tears coat my eyes and I can't breathe. I see a boy running toward me. He's blurred, so I can't make out more than his tall frame and a round wooden paddle in his hand. And for a second, I think he hit me on purpose, and now he's going to hit me with the paddle. But then I see his hand over his mouth, his cheeks a shamed pink. Estas bien? He says, panting. Lo siento, lo siento. I don't answer because, A, I'm still winded. B, I can't say, no, no bien. My chest hurts. I'm crying in front of strangers, and I drop my ice cream in my privates in Spanish. And most of all, C... I'm so scared of him. He has wavy black hair, honey gold skin, jade green eyes, and looks the way I always imagined Romeo would look when we read Romeo and Juliet in Mrs. Gonzalez's class. He can't be more than a couple years older than me. Estas bien, Romeo repeats, kneeling down and clutching my arm. Estamos, Uganda y... He points at two other handsome boys and a skinny girl down the shore, watching us, each holding an identical wooden paddle and waiting for their friend to finish apologizing and bring the ball back. The boy's eyes fall on my backpack. Ah, Americano, he says, touching the Delta luggage tag. Americano in pain, I mumble, rubbing the welt on my chest. To my surprise, he laughs, either because he knows some English or he's relieved I'm responsive. Then Romeo looks around and sees there's no one within 20 feet of me. His thick brows furrow, and he studies my face so intensely and curiously that I'd lose my breath again. Quiere sucar? He asks and holds out his paddle. My stomach flips. Want to play? Romeo, oh Romeo, just asked me if I wanted to play. Do you know the number of times I fantasize about being asked this exact question while watching boys hang out with their friends? My hands sweating. Take it. Take it now. I feel myself reaching for the pa paddle. Tomas, a puerte. I see, I turn and see his friends beckoning him, their eyes shifted away from me. Tomas, that's his real name. And his friends want him back. They don't want me to play. Tomas doesn't either, of course. He's only asked me to be nice and absolve himself of guilt for pelting a lone, lonely tourist. I look up into his shiny green eyes and gently push the paddle toward him. Adios, I say, expecting him to look relieved to be rid of me. But he doesn't look relieved. He looks hurt. 
As he lopes back to his friends and resumes his game, I have the sinking feeling that Tomas wasn't trying to get rid of me at all. He wanted to make a new friend, and I just rejected him the way I thought he was rejecting me. That's what I do every time. That's why I'm always alone. It doesn't matter, I grouse, fumbling for the dried mango in my bag and trying to forget about Tomas, this beach, this entire trip. As I gnaw on the orange shreds, I think about how much better my summer reading essay will be than everyone else's. I think about a science fair project that will make state finals. I think about how this year I'll win more trophies than ever before. But none of it makes me feel happy. It makes me feel worse. I tell Nani that I made friends, that I had a great time. Did you? She says, sounding surprised as we slide into a taxi. Well, you must want to come back tomorrow then. No, it's okay, I say quickly. It's our last day tomorrow. Let's do something else. She doesn't reply. Two hours later, we're standing side by side in a vast smoky kitchen that reeks of olives, olives and Iberian ham. I asked her if we could go somewhere less fancy for dinner tonight, somewhere that wasn't filled with rich old couples. This is my punishment. Sandhosh, you'll have to chop a little faster if you want our dish to actually be served, said Nani, dressed in a sequin pantsuit as she stirs the paella rice. I look up at all the other teams at their cooking stations, hovering over their patatas bravas, berquinones, and paquetitos. It's an authentic Catalan, Catalan cooking class taught entirely in Spanish, so Nani and I only catch every eighth word. Couldn't you have asked Yamia for something taught in English, I growl, and cook with tourists? Or excuse me, and cook with tourists, she flares. Nani commandeers our paella. She's both a brilliant cook and quite competitive, already throwing darting looks at the other teams, while she leaves the lone task of chopping the shrimp. So I've so far I've managed to slice three of them. My mind is still somewhere on the beach. You don't think they have garam marsala, do you? I hear Nanning saying, or at least some red chilies. I ignore her. By the way, what were the names of the friends you made? I snap out of my stupor and I see her sprinkling parsley, parsley over the pan. What? I asked you the names of your friends, she repeats, not looking at me. Oh, I can't remember, I say, suddenly focused on my shrimp. They were complicated names, Spanish ones. I see, and what did you do with these nameless friends? Swam, played ball, usual stuff. You should put the muscles in, Nani. I think he said to put those in before the... Did you speak to them in Spanish or English? I don't see what she glares at me. Or did you sit in the same spot for two hours watching a boy play ball with his friends after that very same boy offered you a chance to join in and you refused? I gawked at her, eyes wide. Then I noticed her hands, hands bearing yesterday's nail polish, hands that never made it to the pink peony. You were spying on me? I yell. The whole kitchen goes quiet. Teams leer at us, their dishes already plated. Nani and I shove a lid on our furies and finish the paella. Well, Nani finishes, I just stew. Neither of us speak in the taxi ride back to the motel, which is fine by me because my stomach feels like a kettle ball. I should have pretended to eat the other team's plates like Nani did and just made do with the olives and prosciutto. I wasn't spying on you, Santosh, she says finally. I felt bad you spent yesterday in a cave, so today when I dropped you off, I waited to make sure you were okay. Then that boy hit you with his ball, and I was about to run down into the sand and give him a beating, but then I saw you talking to him. He even held out the racket as if he wanted you to play. When you pushed it away, I thought it was because you don't like sports. Your mother hates sports, too, like your grandfather. But then instead of going for a walk or swimming or buying more ice cream, you just sat there staring at that boy after he left. I waited so long for you to get up that I almost missed my lunch, but you never moved. My stomach cramps tighter. I can feel my armpits sweating. I wasn't staring at him, I say coldly. She smiles at me. Excuse me. The wonderful thing about Europe is that you can stare at whoever you like and no one cares. I don't smile back. Grandma, I wasn't staring at him. The poison in my voice is so toxic the lightness vanishes from her face. Nani nods, biting the edge of her lip before she peers through her window, and I turn to look at mine. I relish the silence. Though it's, your, though it's a funny thing, she says, at your age, sometimes it's hard to know whether you like someone or whether you just want to be them. 
I turn sharply, but her eyes are locked out the window, where they stay for the rest of the ride. The next morning, I still feel dinner sitting in my stomach. Nani has some last-minute shopping to do, so I tell her I'm going to read in the park until lunch. But I don't go to the park. Instead, I slip my still-wet swimsuit under my shorts and ask pretty bubbly Yamiya at the concierge desk to call me a taxi to the beach. She looks a touch wary of sending me off on my own, but I smile and tell her Nani's sleeping and it seems to do the trick. An hour later, I'm in my usual spot, clutching vanilla ice cream and watching Tomas down the shore tanning in the sun next to the skinny blonde girl who's been playing paddle ball with him the day before. Tomas spotted me when, when I arrived. He craned his head, his eyes flicking over my toothpick frame before he yawned and lay back down on his towel. He didn't look at me after that. Blonde girl nudges him in the chest and says something that makes him laugh. I hate that girl. I hate her stupid blonde hair and stupid mousy face. Hot guilt rushes through me. That girl is his friend. She actually knows Tomas. I don't, and I hate her. Why? Why am I even here? What did I think would happen if I came back to the beach? That I'd get a do-over? That Tomas would hit me with a ball again and ask me to play? Or that he'd bound over and say hi like we're best friends? Oh, you're just a loser, I think. You're delusional. You're sick. Hello, darling, chimes a sing-song voice, and I look up sharply to see a striking older woman barrel by in a glittering gold one-piece swimsuit, a hotel wrapped around her head like a turban. Getting your reading done, I see. Nani? I chase her, hopping like a frog because the sand is so hot. What are you doing here? Yamiya called me, knowing full well I don't sleep late, and told me a cab driver dropped you at the beach, she wisps. If only you'd given me a bit more time to get my hair done. Luckily, I found a swimsuit at the hotel boutique that didn't look too tawdry. I hope your friend likes it. Nani, look, I just wanted to... Wait, what friend? But now I see where Nani is walking. She's headed straight for Tomas. No, 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 I stammer. But she trips me with a swift kick and I face plant in the sand as she motors ahead. Better keep up, darling, I hear her chirp. I scramble to my feet, staggering after her, but she's closing in on Tomas now. He's raising his neck. He's looking at her. He's looking at me right behind her. And just as he and Nani make eye contact, Nani faints. She crumples to the ground in Tomas's lap so exquisitely, so dramatically that I know at once I'm doomed. In a flash, Tomas, Tomas props up Nani's head while blonde girl flutters about in useless panic. I stay right where I am, scowling with arms crossed, fully aware of what's coming next. Nani's eyelids crack open. Santosh! Santosh, sweetie pie. She rasps with a quiv quivery lip, playing it so thick she practically holds for applause. Santosh, where are you? Right here, Lady Macbeth, I snap, glowering down at her. Tomas looks up at me, confused. Concoqueses? Con I'm about to say no. I've never seen this woman in my life and run for the parking lot. But Nani preempts me by lifting herself gingerly and clinging to Tomas's arm like a raft. Come, Santosh, darling, she wheezes, adding a few hacking coughs as if she's faking, fake fainting. She also happened to contract tuberculosis. <coughs> Stay with your Nani and this handsome boy who rescued me. Nani stabs out her hand, seizes my wrist, and with the strength of a sumo wrestler, drags me down into the sand next to Tomas boxing blonde girl out completely. Aqua, she heaves to the girl as if on her last breath. Necesito agua. Blonde girl wrinkles her little freckled nose at me as if getting the woman water would be my job since I'm the one who knows her. But Tomas clears his throat and glares at her until she lets out an audible huff and stomps off. Nani musters another ludicrous cough. <coughs> Now let me have a rest while you two boys get to know each other, she says, before laying her head on Tomas's shoulder and gripping him by the waist as if to trap him in place. Tomas looks at me wide-eyed. Yesterday he hit me with a ball. Today I hit him with Nani. I snicker at the thought. Tomas snorts too, though again I'm not sure what he's laughing at. Soy, Tomas, he says finally. Soy, Santosh, I say. Santosh Americano, he smiles. I nod, blushing hot pink. San Santosh Americano. An hour later, I know a lot more about Tomas. For starters, he's 13. 
The blonde girl is his sister, Carolina, whom he finds a bit clingy and annoying. Indeed, he doesn't intervene when she comes back with water for Nani, water, and Nani owners orders her away again to get ice cream. He lives in Barcelona, but he wants to go to college in America, either Duke or UCLA. He's hoping to become a sports therapist, the kind that run onto soccer fields when a goalie hurts his knee, he says. But he doesn't like American food, so he jokes that if he comes to America, he needs someone who can make him Spanish meal meals. Nani jolts up from her slumber to say she'll teach me to cook for him, but I elbow her hard and she closes her eyes. He likes jazz music, Lord of the Rings, and bike riding, and his favorite movie is Aliens. I lie and tell Tomas I'm 13, so he doesn't think I'm lame. That's the only lie I tell. He knows I like Taylor Swift, E.M. Forrester books, and tennis. I like Federer. He likes Nadal. And my favorite movie is Jurassic Park. I tell him stories about me and Nani's trip. He cracks up when I say she left me at La Mer, La Mer Bella. And he says he wishes he had a grandmother as cool as mine. Nani's lips curl into a smile. We talk in our own chaotic Spanglish, a fluid version of English, Spanish, and body language that makes absolutely no sense, and yet we understand each other completely. I never mention school. I never even think about school. Carolina returns holding a cup of dark green ice cream, but this time she's accompanied by a plump, grumpy old woman I take to be her grandmother, as if the only way to diffuse my nani is with one of her own. Tomasa's face clouds over, as if Grump Granny's presence can only mean one thing. It's time for him to go. Hasta mañana, he asks, looking into my eyes. I shake my head miserably, about to tell, tell him I'm going home. Hasta mañana, Nani interjects, patting Tomasa's back as she pulls off him. She, he looks right at me with a smile so happy and hopeful that my heart swells at the seams, throbbing against my ribs until I see the last of his shadow disappear behind a sandy slope. Why did you lie to him? I turned to Nani. Why did you tell him I'd see him tomorrow? The mischief evaporates from her face. Instead, there's a veil of sadness, as if I've woken her from a beautiful dream. Nani doesn't look vibrant and carefree anymore. She looks old. To give him something to look forward to, Santosh, she says quietly before gazing out at the sea. All of us need something to look forward to. I nestle into her arms as we watch the, the crash and spray of waves. Her arms are so warm, I don't want her to let go. Will you take me on another trip next year, Nani? I ask, tight with emotion. Oh, Santosh, don't you see? She whispers, glassing with tears. You're the one taking me. For a moment, I don't understand, and yet somewhere in my heart, I do. We're the same, Nani and I. Two caged birds searching for a way out. Shouldn't leave it behind, she says, nodding at the cup of half-melted ice cream in the sand next to me. The surface glints in the sun, dark and emerald as a forest. It's the same color as Tomasa's eyes. Go on, then, I hear Nani whisper. I slip a spoonful into my mouth, and sweetness and tartness riot inside me, lighting my heart on fire. Gasping, I turn back. But Nani's gone, and for a second, I look up, thinking she's flown away. <laughs>